Uh, it's very easy to just, just um, join in the last minute or two. Obviously, you know, welcome to the uh, webinar on wireflying and shaping. I'm Thomas Mushro. I'm the uh, product manager for Engineer Products, which is our custom equipment. I'll be the one giving you guys a uh, technical rundown of everything that basically associated with wireflying shaping and what goes on in the equipment selection of it. So uh, um, once I go through the full presentation, we'll then switch it over to question and answering, at which point uh, Annalise here will uh, give you guys actually permission to uh, actually uh, speak audio wise. Currently we have that disabled. And uh, we'll, once we get to that point, obviously, like I said, we'll go over any questions you have. And if you guys have uh, some more uh, personal questions that are a bit more private based on your company and your processes, we can obviously set up a communication after this meeting to go over those uh, more formally. So I'm going to, uh, so let's uh, begin. <laughs> so as I obviously mentioned, this is going to be our wire flight shaping webinar. So this is associated with anything basically in terms of wire, in terms of anything from simple flat and round wire to much more complicated and custom shapes. From a topic standpoint, I'm just going to give you guys a general rundown of some examples of some typical wire lines from both a photo and a video standpoint. I'm going to talk about just generally the applications and industries that they are used for. We're going to talk about just general um, when it comes to sizing, the type of um, standard equipment used for them, as well as in a much more in-depth rundown of basically what type of uh, various type of equipment that may or may not be on a wire line um, and what goes down to selecting and determining them and basically that combination breaking down and what works on it. Uh, one of the things that I'll probably say a few times when talking about this is that uh, some of you I know might have been on for uh, my my rundown when I went over equipment on the drawing side of the application, and also you might have saw some of you might have been on when I went over strip mills and various things like that. Uh, one things I'll say when it comes to those two versus wire flying shaping, wire flying shaping is the most uh, custom element that we do when it comes to here at Fen, because when I talk about those various equipments I talked about in those and or drawing or rolling or things like that. You can see several of those type of equipment you'll see will pop up here on the wire flattening shaping side as well as with other equipment. So when it comes to customizing the lines and the versatility, you have all the variability that you see within those other types of applications and the equipment used for there, plus the added element of combining them with other equipment to make a collective line to service, serve a certain process. So overall, what you'll see a little bit differently on this one versus the other ones, is I'm going to do a little bit more of a surface level rundown in general on wire flattening and shaping and and equipment and purposes and what goes into selection. Um, and obviously, as I alluded to, for those of you, depending on your application and specific needs, I can then talk to you more in detail on a little bit more fine in what's necessary for your specific application in terms of these combinations of equipment. So this video we're popping up right here is just a quick example of a uh, wire flattening and shaping line we've done in the past. Um, this one was running just uh, was running a couple mills in line for the purpose of basically reducing uh, some material down to a certain thickness. Uh, for sake of the customer's standpoint, we'll just uh, leave the term material as is and not talk about what type of material it is. Uh, as we go through the rundown on the line, you're seeing various equipment. Obviously, the, the mills in general being used from a standpoint of a breakdown purpose for um, joined in, in the last minute or two. Uh, answer is in between each of the mill stands, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail for speed and tension control. We have uh, running into obviously a type of coolant table for quenching the material once it's done, as well as a gauging system for monitoring both the width and thickness uh, for uh, both from a monitoring standpoint, as well as controlling it on the fly to the final stand in a, in a closed loop system. And then finally, the wire is being collected on a traversing take up reel, which is another item that we'll obviously be talking about in a little bit more detail where it's collecting in general the finished product with a pretty uniform wrap of layers so we can get as much as we can on the spool with nice even distribution. So uh, when it comes to the industries that we basically work we work with in fried equipment to it's pretty universal. We work with pretty much any industry you name we we dabble in we work in. And these are just to give a few examples of some material industries. So obviously, as some of the ones you see mentioned, is we we work a lot in the medical industry, obviously, which is mostly you see stuff when it comes to like aluminum, stainless steel, titanium wire, things like that is very common. We'll work in the en energy industry, which are guys that deal with more stuff, stuff like copper and materials like that on the energy side. We'll deal with guys that do well screen profile wire, which is very used for various grades of steel. We'll deal with brass, nickel, titanium, you name basically the typical wire you see in the industry, we'll, we'll cover that, such as other ones seen mentioned here, such as automotive and so on. So that's just to give you guys a few examples of some materials and industries you worked in. But in general, we, we 
if you want to think of an industry where wire is commonly used, we've most likely have worked with equipment in that industry and provided it. So uh, when talking wire application size, we can cover an extremely wide range of sizes. Uh, general rule of thumb is that we pretty much uh, we cover wire roughly from about two thou up to about two inches um, in terms of diameter from an inlet. And we've obviously run it. We've done applications for record for stuff larger than two inches, but usually at that point, I'm usually not referring to it as wire. And usually at that point, the material is not uh, running in a coil form. So we're using another equipment first to get it uh, small enough to run in a coil form. Um, and then based on different applications and needs, we run very slow, set up a communication after this meeting. And we've run very high speed lines for production with our top speeds being up near 3000 feet per minute. Uh, so for guys that want to meet high production, uh, wire lines more than anything else, you'll see that we are usually trying to push the limit when it comes to speed capabilities and control. So um, one of the things that you saw a little bit in the breakdown of that first photo I saw was a breakdown of a few different pieces of equipment you typically see. This is to give you a little bit more of a detailed view of that. So uh, typically when you see when we talk about wire um, lines, there's various equipment being used in the process, but a simple a way to summarize it is you basically usually have your payoff equipment right here, which runs through then usually whatever you use is what we call your flattening devices or your breakdown devices, which are commonly the wire mills you see right here. Uh, for those for very commonly in the wire industry, you'll see that a need for controlling a specific shape, controlling your width, controlling your corners. Um, becomes extremely common. So devices such as edgers and Turks heads will frequently show up to basically act as what I've heard is your width control or your shaping devices, depending on application needs. Your speed and tension are usually controlled through some, some level of dancer pulleys or tensiometer roll, as you see this one right here, um, in order to act as a device for monitoring your speed and tension between the various equipment of the line. And then it's typically collected at the end on a take up reel, such as the one you see here. And depending on the application lines, we provide things, as I said, for very small stuff. These are a little bit smaller mills for done purposes to much larger scale lines from running much heavier duty product. And depending on what you need, you may see some or all of these type of equipment shown in this in different combinations and configurations. So when talking about the generally uh, the roll size selection and things. Um, this is a, went over a little bit of this as well for those in the strip mill size. There's a direct correlation between uh, your roll diameter and the reduction you can take. Uh, when it comes to mill rolls, we've done ones typically as small as about 11 16 up to about 35 inches, um, which whether it's strip or wire that we the same mill on basic premise when it comes to roll diameter bearing anything can be used. It's just wire you typically see much smaller rolls. Uh, just by the nature of that, the material not being as large as strip. And typically also in wire, you see much smaller uh, journals and bearings because the loads are less. But in terms of size range, we can cover that full size range. And in terms of uh, questions that people might have of, can we go smaller than 11 16 or 35? Yes, and we have uh, high concepts and things we propose for things smaller than 11 16 and we definitely can do things large in 35. It's just I would say the vast majority of our applications, the typical range you'll see will fall within these parameters, but with custom shapes, if you want to go beyond those ranges. Um, rule of thumb typically, like I said, is that there's a correlation between your roll diameter and how large a hit you can take. There's also a correlation with your roll diameter and how thin you can roll. Uh, when talking round wire, a good rule of thumb is that usually you can take about 1 40th um, the diameter of the roll uh, in terms of a reduction in a single pass. Once that wire has become much more rectangular, much more flat, and no longer has um, that radial curves to it that makes it naturally want to flow to the side as being reduced, it usually translates down to closer to about 1 100th the diameter of the roll. So, usual rule of thumb is from a grip and reduction standpoint the bigger the roll, the heavier the hit you can take. Um, on the opposite side, the, the how thin you can roll is also gauged based on your roll diameter. Pressure is key for gauging thin. Smaller roll has a smaller amount of contact surface, which means you need less force to exert the same pressure. So typical rule of thumb is about 1,000th. The diameter of the roll is usually what the minimum you can gauge to. And depending on certain wires and materials, it may be a little bit more than that. It might be a little bit less than that, but that's just to give you guys a quick standpoint from where to start from. And it's usually that combination of how heavy a hit we want to take, how thin we want to gauge in the load, that um, for those that were that I might have been on the strip mill presentation where I talk about then what dictates both the sizing of the house mill and the housing to support it, as well as what type of role configuration we use to accommodate the customer needs.
So as mentioned at the beginning, there's wire lines are by far the most customizable. Um, roll size and selection, like I said, is pretty much the universal thing you will be see regarding any of the equipment. The mill is the most common, but also in the Turkses and the Yedras, which is why we started with that. But in terms of the various equipment and features, we can they, we can cover a large range of sizes. Uh, the wire mills are by far the most common, which is also a little bit why I start with that. But in terms of other types of equipment we can provide, standards, things you might see is pre-drawing equipment, which are used for controlling your inlet round, because obviously your inlet round is key for what you want to finish at in terms of width and thickness through your scheduling. That's extremely critical. So some customers will draw stuff offline or depending on their needs, we've done things where we draw, where we control the round by doing inline drawing um, with the equipment inline. Tension control is one of the most common things you'll see on wire lines, obviously, because we're running multiple stands or running continuous coil. We have multiple different devices of driven that are driven. So trying to balance that tension for the wire to control it as cleanly as possible is huge. So we usually have a lot of precision put in that. In terms of obviously your coil collection, a servo traverse wind is a very common feature you see, which is why it's one of the ones we more start off at default on our take up reels for collecting the material. And the biggest difference you'll see is the next point addresses too, is when we're talking about the rolling mills in general, the biggest difference you see typically between a strip mill and a wire mill, other than what I alluded to on usually typical on size and journal, is that wire mills we put on a lateral adjustment frame. And the purpose of that is that your wire width is, is obviously usually significantly narrower than your strip and your wire width usually isn't that relatively speaking to the size of the roll and everything that's being worked with is not that large. So we usually give you a roll face that's significantly wider than the face of the wire. And then once you've uh, used up that spot on the surface of the roll, instead of you having to shift your entire wire line, we physically move the roll in the mill itself to allow you to use a different part of the roll surface to give you as much roll life as possible. So outside the common things you see, there are other various things that I wouldn't say are extremely rare, but just to give some more breakdown on the thing is that in terms of the customization from the software standpoint, like a lot of stuff I just alluded to, you have speed, the speed, the dancers and the mills for speed and tension control. You have programmatical pass scheduling you can do. So very common you'll see is any, if we put motorized adjustments on our mills or turkses or edgers, you can preset those gaps ahead of time in order to, for depending on what wire size you're running, if you want to shift between different materials so you can hone in and program to what you need and make the adjustments accordingly. You, we have obviously, when, once you get to motors and things like that, we can obviously also add type of different types of gauging equipment for monitoring the thickness and width and also making it feeding back to different devices for making adjustments on the fly accordingly. And just in general, from a standpoint of software within reason, whatever you're looking to do from a schedule standpoint, diagnostics and different pieces of equipment in line, we can have various sub control stations for each of those so you can fine tune your line as precision as possible, depending on suiting your needs. So um, a few slides ago, I have say talk about some examples of other of typical equipment you see in the lines. And one of the common I saw was the mills, but the other ones that you fre see, frequently see are things such as uh, traversing take ups or in general for collecting the wire, dancers or tensioners for speed and tension control, edgers, which are used for controlling the width, as well as uh, turk sets, which are can used for controlling just general shape from a width and thickness and can be used for making a uh, shaped wire. Annealing equipment, which can be done offline or if you guys have annealing equipment that you'd like to use, but depending on your production, you want to go in line. We've uh, designed, we can definitely integrate them in line. So once we've done all the reducing of material and the material is work hardened, they can then be annealed prior to going on to the take up back down to the desired uh, material properties that you want. As mentioned, gauging for width and thickness control, which is very commonly we use on wire lines to communicate with the final device and the final device or two devices in the line for, for monitoring and making automatic adjustments so we can control your product to its key spec. And then for those of you that aren't collecting on winding equipment, we also have done stuff such as inline cutting equipment with delay loops, either a fixed cutter or a flying shear in order to physically cut the material to your certain lengths and sizes that you use for your next step in your application. And then very commonly, you see you will see with typically wire lines, because as I mentioned, we're running nearly, we can run up to speeds of up to 3000 feet per minute. The heat generating the wire, the heat generating the rolls can be extremely high. So in ex internal, external coolant and lubrication is a very common thing you'll see that is pretty universal with our wire lines. So one of the items obviously I brought up a few times that we'll start with is our take ups, which just also ties a little bit to our payoffs as well. So when talking our take-ups and our payoffs, there's pretty much one primary difference you'll see between them, which is our take-ups obviously have mobility for collecting the wire in an interweave. Our payoffs don't have that traverse mechanism from a fixed standpoint. 
And then depending on the size of the wire coil and weights, sometimes our payoffs just use a brake and don't have a motor. But in terms of the framework and the rest of the design, you'll see usually a lot of symmetry between our payoff and our take-ups, depending on customer needs. Uh, so the take-ups, basically, they come in about three different style of forms. Uh, two of them is where we traverse the take-up itself, which are the ones we're going to start to talk about. And then I'll slip over to the uh, this third style, which is where we traverse the guide. So the two the two most common we'll see are where obviously the two where we traverse the uh, the reel itself in order to balance the wire, the, and which mostly we do with that with either what's called a pintle type or cantilever type. The pintle type is the type you'll see here, which is that's basically used for almost almost universally on spools, um, and it's used for spools in which the you're basically your bore size that's used for mounting your shaft on your spool relative to your OD the element of combining them with other over a small shaft, which can cause a lot of strain and sag. So we basically have auxiliary equipment for supporting the spool and thus taking some of that load off while we wind and collect in order to deal with the, uh, the difference of weight relative to the size of the thing supporting it. In general, when we're talking about a traversing takeoff, we just apply to this one as well as the next one. The key in how we focus on this is that we that we physically move the spool back and forth using a traverse using, using a traverse mechanism. It can be done in a few different ways, but by far the most common you see is that we usually use a precision ball screw with a servo motor to move it back and forth and shuttle it. We run a basically a timing of our software, so we take into account the speed at which we're going at um, to know how quickly we basically collect the wire on on, what, on any individual section for a full revolution of the drum, and then slow and then time it with the moving of the traverse to move the spool back and forth so that the wire interweaves with with right in the side by side with each other with minimal to no overlap and gets this level rundown in general on wire flattening. We count that as we're collecting the material over time, the size of the, the OD of the wire on the drum is building up, which means we and shaping and spec and quell accordingly in order to maintain the same speed as the material builds up for collection purposes. So that's very that's typically how our traversing take ups is the most common you see function. The other type of obviously the traversing style we see is cantilever. This can be used for both spool types and uh, collapsible drums. It's base, it can um, it can be used for a variety of different things, but our cantilevers are basically more what we refer to as like it's an overhung low style. So we don't we don't have a pintle support for holding it. It's almost all dead weight held on the shaft. And when it comes to removal, we can have obviously the spool come off, similar like you saw on the pin, on the pintle style, or in the case of this one, which I wanted to use as a photo reference. This is be, this is used for a for a, a coils, a drum style coil system instead of a spool. Uh, we basically, the customer, once they're done collecting their coil, they strap the coil down through those slots you see there on the drum. They take the front off, they sling it, and then they take the coil off for purposes of unloading. So that's just, and that's to give you an idea of typically what a cantilever over homelog style uh, take up use, as well as one that's used for a uh, coil collection instead of spool purposes. So the third type of take up you typically will see is what we call a traversing wire guide. Um, so traversing wire guide take up, um, the primary difference is that the, ta the take up drum itself doesn't move. Instead, the, a guide on the front moves back and forth to force the wire to lay over separately. Um, typically, we only use this for applications in which the precision of how it lays on the spool is A, not as critical, and the cost of the line is uh, needing to be maintained at a certain financial level. Because overall, the, the, these are basically your most economical, most affordable design. They're the simplest, but because you're forcing the wire over by guide instead of naturally having the drum move and and thus to match the wire, you're, it's not as precise. It's not as clean. So a mass majority of the application you see, we're traversing the drum, but there are certain applications depending on the customer's needs um, in terms of complexity as well as financials, we will shift to a traversing wire guide to give them a more economical solution. So um, the next piece of equipment we'll talk about outside of our winding equipment is, um, our, which is a, which is our edgers. Um, anytime you're dealing with just nature of controlling your corner radius is and wanting to create sharp corners with some basic control on width, edgers become a very common thing you see in the line. They work on the same premise of a rolling mill. With a rolling mill, you're using vertical rollers to flatten the thickness down and create a uniform surface. With edge rolls, you're you're targeting the side instead using that same idea of roller contact to reduce the width and control and create control your flatness there, thus giving you a sharper corner. The one big difference between a roll typical wire mill and an edger 
though, is that with an edger, we're not actually running slot, uh, flat rollers. It might be hard to see, but if you look very carefully at this photo, you can see a little bit of a profiling in the roll. The rolls themselves are basically slotted for alignment purposes. So they're slotted to slightly above the thickness of the material and they basically match the geometry. So if it's a rectangle, it's basically two U slots. If it's a more complicated shape, they're thus used to basically when they're put together to replicate the geometry of that shape. And obviously your edger's purpose, obviously, like I said, is basically to come in front of that into that material with the slots basically holding in place, reducing the width on side, well as well as giving it minimal room to flow so that when it does flow, it basically only flows to the cavities that the edger allows giving you a little bit of a tighter corner as well, letting that natural round that the mill produces and giving you a better shape overall from a width standpoint. The edges themselves can be either just a simple friction style, which is what you see in this photo here. With that, usually there's a secondary device that pulls it, which can be a variety of things. It can be an ex a separate capstan, or it can be in which is very commonly you'll see in our wire lines is when edges are used. We mount the edger basically in front of, of a wire mill itself. So, the wire mill pulls the material through the edger, the edger cleans up the width of it, and the mill continues to work the thickness more so they work in tandem off of each other. Edgers, because of the nature that they're only contacting the width, they're like I said, they're like I said, their primary purpose is for when you want to do a lot of work on the width, but your overall shape and contour nature doesn't need to go beyond that in complexity. For stuff that require a little more complex shape and things like that, we'll be getting or a little bit more precision on the shape. We'll get into our Turk sets, which for that, which we'll be talking about in a couple of slides. So one of the devices also I mentioned on outside in general is speed and tension control, uh, which are the two most common are to use uh, dancers or tensiometers. The devices you see in this photo here are, are two examples of dancers, which we use basically a pulley mechanism that's either in, that's either in two different types of planes, as you can see. Um, and all that they work on the basic premises, we're wrapping the wire around the dancer pulleys creating a natural delay loop. You have a natural amount of buildup of material. If you're, and thus, if your line, one device in your line runs a little too far hard, it then pulls on the material, which raise, raises the pulley on it and has some room for you to adjust. If your device is running too slow and thus the mill before it's out feeding it, the pulleys will sag a bit and you have thus again, room to adjust. Now, when I talk about the idea of the room to adjust, we're using, a, we're using an encoder to monitor the position of those pulleys when we're running this type of system. And we're setting pneumatic pressure on those pulleys from a stability standpoint. The pneumatic pressure, that's your tension value. That's how much load you naturally want to have for tension on the wire, which is how much the basically the next device in the line is exerting on the material as it pulls it through the process. If your tension falls below that target, your pulley moves down, we get a signal telling the, the next piece in line to speed up. If the tension, if the if the pulley raises up, that means we're out feeding it and we know to slow down to adjust. This is how we work basically on a similar, basically a master slave relationship between the driven device and the line. Whatever the master is, it keeps its speed and the other one raises or lowers speed accordingly in order to keep the pulleys in position of stability from a tension standpoint. Your tensiometers, they work on a similar premise. They also they use a tension value, which we use in a load cell for monitoring your forces and controlling them for the same purpose of tension. And they work on the same idea that master slave of speed up or slow down to stay within the value of the load cell. The load cell's primary difference is that it's not being you're not wrapping your material around a large number of pulleys and creating a large delay loop. You're usually wrapping you're usually just wrapping around a single or at most a couple of rollers with a very minor um, bend to it. And the per and typically you see tensiometers going to play is when you're dealing with much what you're dealing with larger uh, stiffer wire that by nature the idea of manually bending around this would be uh, not easy to do from a setup standpoint and you'd be no more concerned with the nature of the wire once it came off of that of picking up some of those force bends in its twist. <laughs> So we use then at that point a tensiometer with a load cell from a standpoint of a monitoring purposes, which works on the same basic premise of you, you basically have the material naturally pushing down or the load cell pushing or roll the load cell pushing on the material. That's a reading of value. As material gets kicked up or kicks down, you'll see the load cell value change, which is a, its signal to tell the devices in the master slave relationship to make their adjustments accordingly. So any, any wire line you see almost universally, if there's more than one device that we're providing that's motorized, you will see 
a dancer, a tangiometer, or for some applications, a combination one, which has both be to cover based on the customer's wire size range, located between every driven device in the line so that they can properly communicate with one another from a speed and tension control standpoint. So the final item of talk about of note, which is which is why I left this for last, is the Turks heads. The reason why I left this mostly for last is that the everything else I just mentioned, the wire lines are very common. They're used very frequently, and then the Turks heads obviously are no different. But the difference is is that when it comes to the heart of wire of wire flattening and shaping, the last word being the keyword, the Turks head is is the heart of that. It's the most common device you will see anytime you're doing specialty shaped wire or running uh, even square rectangular wire of a certain size um, and that you want to really control the shape and contours of. They And thus they're usually frequently, like I said, the last piece in the line and their purposes is their shape horse. They don't have much, they have small bearings. They're not meant to take heavy loads. Their purposes is all about just making the geometry of your profile. So when we're talking about wire lines and freak in customization, frequently you'll see things like wire mills doing a lot of work ahead of time. And then this will be right at the end to do the cleanup work. So that's why I just generally wanted to save this one to the end as the summation. Uh, when talking about the Turks heads, there's a lot of vari variability and there's a lot of configurations. I'll be talking about a few. Uh, on the basic level, we'll be talking about the idea of uh, pull through Turks heads, power Turks is the Turks head mills. And then once we go through just general differences between those three, we're going to be talking about what I call about the different types of configurations even within those three types of Turks heads that are you that are more dependent on the shape of the wire you're try trying to produce. So probably the most common you'll see is the pull through Turks heads you see in our lines. Um, what basically we're, we're using with those is we're using an external device, most likely usually a double capstan. It can be a shedding drum or some other type of pulling device to pull the material naturally through the Turks head rolls. The rolls themselves that are non-driven, they spin through friction contact. And we, we with our pull through Turks heads, we can provide them for a variety of different applications and speeds. And we have ones with certain types of Turks heads for the pull through that have bearings rated up to 1500 feet per minute. So for some high speed lines, you'll very much see pull through Turks heads come into play. The biggest uh, reason why I'd say pull throughs are our most common is for two purposes. One is that their advantage over power driven is that if your line is one where you're running heavy duty wire and thus having good back tension is critical, a pull through carries advantage over that. And the other one is by nature, as I just mentioned, is the pulling device. Pulling devices you can find everywhere. There are many customers and some of you work a lot in the medical industry. I don't have, have pulling devices you've used from old lines that are, that you're not using currently anymore. And thus attaching a pull through Turk said with that is very commonly done from a standpoint of just usability and taking advantage of existing equipment that the customer may have, which is why the pull through is the most common, but it's by no means the only type. So. The next type we're going to get to is what's called a power driven Turk sets. Um, from a financial standpoint, I'd say a power driven Turk set costs about roughly the same as the pull through equivalent to it, plus the pulling device. Its biggest advantages are all of that pulling device and everything that's normally used for pulling it is built into the structure of the Turk set. So from a floor space standpoint, it's a lot smaller from a right off the bat. So that makes it a lot better from a standpoint of scrap generation, from just general fitting on a footprint and things like that with working with other devices. The other big thing that power driven are used for across other than just a floor space and a, uh, and a scrap side of it is for applications where a direct drive is key. I just mentioned how with a pull through Turks that having back tension is very useful for applications where you might have very thin fine wires, um, having back tension doesn't necessarily having a lot of back tension is not a good thing. We'll deal with guys that do well screen wire. And thus what a power Turks edge use advantage is by having your direct drive sense to it, you can usually get gauged thinner than with a pull through Turks said before you risk having the material naturally break under tension. So for applications where we're trying to go very thin or where we're worried about just the nature of the material itself being something that could break under tension, you'll see power driven show up a lot more often and then as well for applications where the cost per foot of the material is very high you'll see power driven show up much more often because they generate a lot more less they generate a lot less natural scrap third type of turk said configuration when i talk about and just in terms of driven and non-driven is our turk said mills 
reason I separate these from the other two um, is by nature, the Turk said mill is basically a specialized version of a power Turk set. So it works on the same premise. It's a driven device. It's using four rollers, just like a power Turk set. But as you can see by his photo here, it visually looks uh, quite different. Turk said mill is basically used for applications in which the size of the material being run and its tensile natures and its properties make it to the point where you need four rollers to shape it just like on the premise of the way a Turk's head works. But as I mentioned earlier, your Turk's head is usually not a workhorse in terms of heavy hits. It's using, usually, usually using small needle roller bearings. This one's the exception to that. This is an application. These are used for applications where you need a shaping device to do this type of work, but you're generating a lot of load. So it basically is fitting the concept of a Turk's head in terms of the roller and configuration works in a much more rigid structure like a mill housing, hence the name the Turk's head mill. So these are very com these are more commonly used with guys that are running very like I said large diameter product and high tensile products. So your titanium guys, for example, are one of the ones that you might see having equipment like this. So this is just to give an example for certain applications where you might need this third type of Turk set based on your needs. So outside of just the nature of driven, non-driven, and Turk set mill. Your configuration, the way your rollers work, um, become another big factor when it comes to the selection of your Turk set. Overall, what we talk about is that there's basically two types of configurations that you can run your rollers in, the universal and the planar configurations. So the universal configuration, which is the most common you see, we deliberately offset, the rolls are offset from one another. They're not directly in line. And from an adjustment standpoint, this screw right here you see would move these two rolls up and down and this screw here would move this roll and this roll in and out together as a collective. What that does is it, a, is it allows you to basically, with your roll configuration, accommodate a wide variety of width and thicknesses with the same roll, flat rollers, as well as give you very easy adjustment for width and thickness control. So for your guys that are only running square and rectangular shaped wire, the universal configuration is the one that you'll see. It's, which is why I said like it's the most common because if that's when it comes to shaped wires, simple squares and rectangles are the most common you'll see. The downside to this universal configuration is obviously is because your rolls are all set from each other, they pretty much are only good for wire that is a square or rectangle. They're not really good for any other type of shape. That's where the planar configuration comes into play, which the planar, we run the rolls deliberately in line with each other, your top and bottom roll and your side rolls. And then for specialty shaped wires, your triangles and your much more complicated shapes. We basically design geometry profiles in the top and bottom roll from a basically a male female standpoint where they line off of one another. And then the, the contact of the top and bottom roll together, as well as with the side rolls, basically create the physical geometry of the shape that you want to produce and finish at. The downside to that is that it's great for making shapes, but because your top and bottom roll are perfectly aligned with each other and you adjust them all independently, your width is your width. If you want to run a true rectangular wire, you only can run a rectangular wire that's the same width as the face of the roll, which is way why the universal configuration is used for squares and rectangles, and your planar configuration is used for shaped wire, which then leads us to the third version you see here. I know I kept saying that there are two types of configurations. There are. This third version, the combination, it's what we call our specialist you can set your rolls in either the universal or the planar configuration. So for those of you that run variety of shape wire, both your squares, your rectangles, and your shaped, the combination is what's being used, which is why it's probably the second most common. I only give the, this four roll adjustment Turks at plane type for those that are only ever going to run a specially shaped wire and never square rectangles. I give the universals to only those that are only gonna run square and rectangles and never gonna run specially shaped wire. I give this unit to those that run both. So this one, because of all the screw axis adjustment, have a lot more flexibility. From a standpoint of just the way these screws work, these are not uh, running in a coil form, so the nature of the planer and allow you to move each of these up and down and in and out independently. These two external screws you see here, that's what readjusts the position of the rolls well to, relative to one another. And that's what then allows you to shift your roll configuration from the universal configuration where the rolls are all set from each other to the planer where they're in line with each other. So that's what those additional two axes adjustment give you. The downside to this unit is that by having more adjustability and axes of adjustment, that gives you a lot more flexibility. But for setting up something simple, it makes adds a lot more time, adds a lot more complexity just by the nature of having those axes, which is 
So that's basically why we only give combinations for those that really want to run it in both configurations. This is your can run everything, but takes a little bit more time. And these two are the the easy set of time for one special need. So that's just basically talking about the three types of Turks configuration you see in your orientation, what basically dictates our selection of those depending on your needs. So when talking on Turks heads in general, uh, I've obviously just given you visuals of the power types, the Turks and mills and the role configurations. In terms of features, we can provide a lot of different things with our Turks heads similar to our rolling mills and things like that. The adjustments you saw on at least a few of those in example were just simple, um, just simple screws that you would put a wrench or ratchet on to move up and down. We can add simple gearboxes for those that will still just need to only make manual adjustment, but want to make it a little bit more of a fine rotation. We can add motors to this to the uh, to the Turks head, uh, giving you motorized adjustment. We'll usually use servo motors with built-in encoders, which gives you precision control. And that usually then allows us to tie it into a uh, your AGC loop that we mentioned from a gauge standpoint. If you're trying to make a, let's say a rectangular wire, and thus your width and thickness are critical, we can have motorized adjustment on a U-type Turk set, one for your thickness axis, one for your width axis. Your gauge monitors both the width and thickness, and each one feedbacks to each of those motor separation, uh, wire lines more than anything on the fly, and keep things well controlled. And obviously, um, as similar with the mills, external coolants is extremely common. We're talking about high rotation rolls. We're talking about wire. Your heat on your wire and your heat on your rolls can get quite a lot, which can lead to either metallurgical breakdown in your material under heat or, and or thermal expansion of the rolls, which can affect your thickness. So having some type of coolant system with um, externally on the Turks that's only, we provide external and internal options for the mill, is very commonly seen and used on the wire side. Uh, and then one other feature in general to talk about when it comes to both the Turksids and the mills, but I would say you will see this mostly in, on the Turkshead mills, which is why I've called this down the Turkshead section and not part of that, is what's called asymmetric rolling. Asymmetric rolling is a premise of being able to spin the top and bottom roll uh, independently of each other at different, basically at different speeds. Mm -hmm. The biggest benefit of doing that is if you are running non-continuous material, so short length material. The, if your material is naturally going up based on the strain, your feed and everything else, you can drive the top roll a little bit faster and basically counteract that effect. If you're running wire under continuous tension, you don't want to spin your top and bottom roll at different speeds. You want them to stay the same, which is why I said it's most commonly seen on like your Turks and mills and occasionally your power Turk sets because those, although frequently used in wire lines for continuous, they're also people that may be running shorter piece material through them as well for their shaping purposes for make for making various sections and that's why we give that option at, for the driven ones in case it's needed and just in general when you're talking turks heads or mills or edgers or any of those shaping devices i brought up that can be used in the process depending on the level of precision and accuracy we'll provide some level of guiding typically and we can even provide on our turks heads if we're selling them as a standalone piece instead of collectively with the rest of the equipment we can have sell them with guides physically attached to them ahead of time just for ease of a lot, getting your wire threaded properly into the roll for its reducing purposes. Like I mentioned, obviously, this is just to give you guys some examples of a lot of the different shapes we've done in the past for our Turk sets. Um, one simple like these squares and rectangles would be done on your, in your universal configuration. The rest of these would basically be done in a planer. Uh, depending some of these shapes for perspective, just to talk a little bit on them, uh, can be made in different ways. So ones like these triangular wires or even ones like this that you see, um, those are pretty, pretty much those are commonly used, made by uh, using basically a mill or another device to flatten material to a rectangle. And then you break, bring it into a roll with a male and female geometry that matches basically this angle on this material to then create your finishing shape. For shapes more complicated like this one here or this one here or even this one that have been made, you might, you probably would do what's called a multi-stage uh, shape process through the Turks, which is you create your initial rectangular and profile, which runs through then usually in, over maybe two or three hits, depending on the complexity of the shape, in order to create your finished geometry. So depending on applications and needs, this is another thing, like I said, that it's the combination of equipment and the quantities can vary dramatically because what we call your flattening device applications, you might be just doing a simple square on a Turk set and a Turk set alone. For other ones, you might have multiple mills for reducing the thickness down and then doing a final shape like this on a Turk set, and you'd have only one Turk set. 
And then there's certain applications such as like this one or some of the more complicated shapes where you might have maybe one or two mills doing reducing work. You might then have an edger for just cleaning up the corner radiuses of the edge right before it goes into the second mill. And then you have multiple Turk sets do it in running in tandem to create your shaping. And then, or you could even be using a slight initial profile geometry in your mill roll to create some initial shaping with your Turks and the more fine finish the shape. So a lot of when it comes down to the size selection and things that we'll talk about, like that's just to give you a rundown of when we're staring the application and selecting the machine. Oftentimes what we're staring at is your finished shape and what you're starting with and, and be in, in what that what is drives everything else accordingly into that combination. So um, this is just like I said, like as alluded to, obviously in all those photos and things, the combinations dram change dramatically depending on your size and needs. And this is just to give you one visual example of what like a line we did in the past. We ran a two plane straightener for basically knocking out cast and helix into the wire. We use a single mill for taking the round wire, knocking it into a natural edge flat. We then ran it over this combination dancer tensiometer for the smaller wire. It used a dancer for the larger wire. It used this tensiometer pulley up here. It then ran through a Turk set on a pulling capstan. The Turk set then shaped it accordingly to their finished profile while being collected through on the caps and to pull it through for back tension. And then it threaded through another dancer device for speed and tension control purposes as it then collected onto this take up reel for collecting the finished product. So that's just one example of what you might see for a combination of various equipment used in a line. And depending on needs and things, we've done lines where we've had up to eight mils in line with edgers and Turks heads with them. And we've done lines as simple as just, like I said, a single Turks head on their own. So depending on what you need, you might, what these types of equipment and their quantities can vary greatly. So um, one of the last things I just want to show is we're a couple slides away from the end, just shows another quick example of uh, things we can do is that at the end of the day, we're a custom design house. So our specialty is to try to offer all in one solution. So if you, depending on what you're looking to do, we, we within reason can provide every piece of equipment in the line. So like the slide I showed you before, one example of a line is, is an example, but even for at other applications and industries where there I know there are customers that might be taking, for example, square and rectangular wire and using it to make certain types of springs. This is just an example of something we've done in the past where, yeah, we're, we're taking obviously a payoff, running it through a Turk's head to shape the wire, running it through a delay loop into our spring coiler, which is making the spring and cutting it, which obviously then for, as I mentioned, for those that need a delay loop and a cutting action, this is just one example of the device that's bending and cutting, but we can also do with other types of cutters and, other, and twisting mechanisms for different industries. So just in general, when it comes to what you're looking to do, we can either provide one piece of equipment to go into the line, or we can provide you the collective line, just depending what you need. And we can talk about in general from that perspective. So that's basically where we've reached uh, the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, I'm going to now uh, stop sharing screen. And we'll go into more of the, uh, the question and answer side of it. So uh, Annalise is going to filter through some of the questions I know you guys might have posted while I was talking. I'm going to start, though, at least initially with uh, some of the stuff that you guys might have sent ahead of time. So one of you one of you asked, and this is a very common question, is how to calculate width increase and then obviously increase in width versus thickness reduction. Um, it's for that, it's extremely uh, process dependent. Um, and I, I hate to dance around that because I know you're looking for hard numbers, but yeah, there is there's various correlation factors that you can know. A rule of thumb I typically say as a starting point of reference is using roughly a standard size roll with standard size material. If you want to have a certain width and thickness um, as a finish, it's usually roughly the summation of those times about 0.55 gives you a within like usually plus or minus five to 10 percent your starting diameter that you need to produce that width and thickness. Beyond talking about that as a very rough standpoint, your roll diameter has a factor on your width. The bigger your roll, the more it naturally wants to spread to the side, the more width you'll get versus a smaller roll. Same idea with thickness reduction. That initial hit, especially that first hit in a wire line when your wire here, and depending on the application trick, that is the point at which you get your most spread. So on, so on wire mills in general, especially, you that lot that first hit is where you're taking the heaviest hit you can physically take in terms of reduction with the biggest roll that allows you to take that hit as well as working a little bit on the geometry roll to allow you to get that spread and frequently what we end up doing is we try to overfill it so we get a not dramatically over but maybe slightly over the wet width you need so and then use a turk set to find adjust and control the wet the width or an edger to its higher accuracy at that point when talking round wire, 
depending on the tensile properties in your wire, we can get various different results, but a usual good rule of thumb is you can usually cut that wire diameter in half, go for in terms of your thickness in, in a single pass. I've done for some wires that are much softer, especially a, a copper, for example, I've done over 60%. And that's where the other side of, in terms of your width spread, what I just talked about in terms of your, other than your thickness reduction and your roll diameter having to factor, your material is a huge factor. If you're, if you're running high tensile spring steel, you're gonna see a lot more just natural elongation than spread to the side. It will spread to the side in round form, but if I took the same reduction schedule and the same size roll on something that's high tensile spring steel versus soft annealed copper, I'm probably gonna get like a 30 to 40% more increase to the side on the copper than I am on the spring steel. And which goes to then talking a little bit more on the width side of it is, typical rule of thumb is that with the exception of the first pass where I can go beyond that, um, what, depending on what you want to finish width and thickness wise relative to your, um, in terms of your width and thickness ratio, if you're starting with round, I usually dictate that you can roughly double your width with each consecutive stand in the line until you get to your pretty flat as possible, roughly speaking. So if you need an eight to one width and thickness ratio, uh, depending on the tensiles of your material, you it would be roughly three stands. Now, I say roughly because, like I said, that first pass, you can get a lot more, especially with, like I said, materials like copper. So for eight to one on copper, I probably could do that with two stands. If you said, hey, I want to do eight to one on spring steel, I go, you might be pushing the limit on two stands. Usually that first stand, I can usually get three, maybe a little bit more than that, and then I'm basically doubling it every time after that. So for guys that want to do like 20 to one, I might get three to one on the first stand, increase it to roughly six to one, increase it to 12 to one, use a four stand to get it to like 23 to one ish, and then come in with a Turk set or edger to knock it back down to that 20 to one ratio, just as a quick example. <laughs> so that's just to give some general rundown on, on that. And if there's certain um, material process you run where you want a little bit more accuracy, we've been running wire for, 70, 80 years. So there are some applications, but by no means all, where we have certain material, most commonly steel, where we've developed roll curves for typically based on this material's behavior and things. This is what we usually see as your limit for one pass, what you see for spread. But so we can assist a little bit on that. But at the end of the day, when it comes to all the materials and their behaviors, it's going to be, it's definitely going to have some process development on the end user side. And we'll like with basically everything I just said, with a little bit more added on is, we will assist as best we can, but there might be some little bit of experimentation to really find your ideal starting round in order to get and your reduction schedule in order to get the spread that you really a small about. <laughs> so um, what have you obviously asked about hex um, hexagonal wire shaping? Uh, that can be done um, pretty much within reason, depending on what shape of wire you want to do, we can provide it within reason. The only key thing that I talk about in general and with hexagonal, I'm going to probably emphasize a little bit more is your corner radius matters a lot in terms of how tight you want it to be, because even using an edger or using a Turk set, um, you still are naturally flowing the cavities of the roll. So you can have pretty tight radiuses, but they're still radiuses. They're not sharp corners. Obviously, a hexagonal shape wire on basic premise obviously has a lot more corners to it. So depending on how tight a corner you want to do, you could do this on a, on a Turks on a shaping unit where we probably would use most likely a Turk set or a couple Turks or through a couple passes of it or multiple Turk sets in order to create that structure, most likely starting from round and slowly shaping it down into that hexagon. I would probably have the round larger just for background than the actual uh, finished thickness of the material because one rule of thumb I'll say is that although I said that 0.55 for generally when you're talking to width and thickness, that ratio basically only applies if you're talking stuff that's above a two to one with the thickness ratio for stuff. So stuff you're really trying to make thin and wide. For shapes where you're want much more closer to one to one or less, so you're things that are squares or hexagons or things like that, where you have a lot more uh, symmetry. I'm basically looking at the area of that material and going, okay, I'm gonna maybe go 10% larger or depending on how high the tensile is, maybe 20% or something like that, larger in starting area than I am than what I am in finish area and having the Turks 
why you see much smaller uh, journals and bear letting it as I'm reducing the round down fill in the cavities that are missing that from the round profile. The one of the most common mistakes uh, customers make when they're trying to take a round and produce any type of shape wire on a Turk set is that they basically select a round where the uh, diameter is the same as basically the on a square wire let's the diagonal across the edges. That's that's giving them no flow. That's giving them no room for the material to naturally spread. And when you do that and overfill, you're basically going to overfill your your shaping device. And you'll see what I refer to as flashing, um, which is you overfill the corners. You don't get clean radiuses. And the reason why we refer to it as flashing is that usually when you take, especially it's on big wire, it's not subtle at all. You can see it very clearly on small wire. If you just twist it slightly in the light, you're going to see that 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 overflow edge immediately shine very brightly and thus it flashes. So that's where it at least comes to, at least in terms of if you want us interested in making something that we can definitely talk to you about that, but it's definitely in general, when it comes to size selection and things, it has to be wary on your process development. Um, when you asked about taking a rod into OTMB shaped flat wire, yeah, we if you if we obviously want to talk in more detail on that, we can. We obviously as alluded to on some of the other stuff, and probably what you got to just up through the presentation is we can uh, we can within reason, depending on your sizing and what you want to do from a profile geometry and things, we can provide equipment to suit your needs and can talk to you in more detail. Um, developing a triangular profile. A uh, high carbon steel wire, 12 by um, of a feet of, of a certain size range, uh, that can be done. Uh, my only question on that, and just to get a little bit of detail, is when it comes to the uh, what type of triangle. Um, to go back just a couple slides real quickly, just for talk. If you're talking a triangle like this, where it's isosceles, yeah, I can do that on a very standard plain type Turk said might need to do some pre-reducing ahead of time on a mill, as I alluded to, and then make that geometry of the profile. Or depending, obviously, with how large you were talking, um, depending on your radius tolerance and things, I might even be able to do some preliminary shaping work in a mill roll to create some of it, and then maybe just do a little cleanup on a Turk set. If you're talking an equilateral triangle, one where all three sections are evenly the same, that can be done, but we're actually talking a, a different beast that I originally, I originally deliberately left out because it's I would say it's in terms of Turk heads. If I provide 100 Turk heads, there might be one person that asked me for this, um, which is what we call a T-type Turk set. It's instead of being a four roll unit, it's a three roll unit. Each and each roll is made to the exact width that you need of your finished product, and you bring the rolls in and out to basically create the geometry of your equilateral triangle accordingly and create your shape. So that definitely can be uh, covered based on uh, you talking this being high carbon steel and you're talking things that are 20 by 20 by 20 millimeters on your large end, you're talking very big stuff. So it's a type of stuff where depending on how much production you need in redu reducing, only thing I'll say is a only level of concern I'd raise too is that you would either meet a lot of passes through a big turk, even one of our bigger turk sets, or I might have to go to something a little bit more specialty um, than a standard turk set because of the loads I'm expecting to be generated in the shaping process. But it's something where we can definitely look into if you're interested. Um, these last two uh, next two are sort of uh, tied together. Um, so software required design and roll shape wire shape. Uh, a lot of it is there's no I'd say with things like our springs and our winding index and things are softwares we definitely designed for geometry because they're working with the ex material of very similar tensile properties and behaviors because on the wire side. We work with every material you can name from very low tensile stuff of aluminum to extremely high tensile stuff like music wire. The way it behaves, especially based on size range in terms of the way the material flows, is significantly different. So oftentimes when it comes to tooling and process development, we, we assist customers on it, we work on it, but it is a little experimental where we'll design things that follow the general flow and geometry we're anticipating, but based on how much the material flows, we might need to we might be we might need to go a little more we might if the material flows naturally like i said is that there's a correlation between your open up um the profiles a little bit to allow that to flow and and cut down our starting round or we might need to tighten up our geometry because it overflowed and thus it came out oversized and thus we need to be a little more aggressive on our reducing so that's generally what um goes into does not like roll wire for wire shaping is it's definitely a little bit of experimental and process development where we use stuff we've done before oftentimes as reference points for similar applications but for new application and material can change 
And that also sort of is what ties into the product profile design is that typically when it comes to profile design, your final role is final design matches almost verbatim the geometry of your finished product, usually being slightly smaller than it, taking account that you're going to get some spring back and natural flow to expand. So usually that's what comes into your final one. And then depending on what you do in your process development, as I alluded to, if you can't do that from that reduction at once and create your shape evenly, then you will in process development basically design what I'd call like a transition step in your shape where you slowly bring it in little by little because of the metallurgical characteristics of your material in order to create your section. Yep. And then obviously the final one that was originally brought up at the beginning at, at, on ahead of time uh, was regarding stuff on flat and section wire springs, which yeah, that's why why far finish on that slide is that yeah, for those of you that run spring wire and thus obviously want to make spring shaping, we can provide a uh, shaping units that you can use offline, either in mills or turks, like I showed in that photo, or we can uh, tie them in line with our coilers or even your existing coilers um, in order to uh, work together collectively for certain spring applications where you're not just running a uh, round wire and need something a little bit more of a uh, geometry of shape. The role uh, in terms of you guys do want to uh, talk more in detail or questions on things in general. Um, and we analysts can send to you guys. We'll post in the chat probably right now as we end off my contact info for the reduction in a single pass through our sales portal and pop onto the right people or to me if you want to talk technically. Um, so obviously if there's nothing else, uh, I hope you guys have a uh, have a uh, good afternoon.